Okay, welcome to the ch welcome to the lesson on class. So social class is one of those issues that we probably don't talk enough about. We've already looked at diversity relating to race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, um, and we we certainly got more to do here. But social class is one of those areas that is so extremely important in our society. Um, when we talk about social class, we're talking about really where you fit in, sort of. Uh, the social hierarchy yet and so we're talking about your socioeconomic status your economic position and rank within your society of course when we talk about a social class it implies that people are different that they, they belong to different classes and that it's not all equal so belonging to an upper class um, you probably certainly have more benefits than belonging to a lower class so what I mean by that is you have more access to power, you have more access to wealth, to resources, to those sort of things. So the social class has really become a very powerful feature in American society. In fact, social class, uh, many sociologists would argue, has become the most powerful um, dividing feature or stratifying feature in modern society, certainly in the United States. So I want to take a look here just a little bit at social class. Now, um, one of the founding fathers here actually starts, starts really talking about this, and you've probably heard of him. He's come up in this course a little bit before, but Karl Marx, uh, when he first started writing about social class, he divided social classes into these sort of two classes. One he called the bourgeoisie, and the other one he called the proletariat. For Karl Marx, and remember, he's writing at the time of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's just the birthplace of factories. If you're thinking about this era, it's the era um, that Dickens was writing about and A Christmas Carol and all the other Dickens stories. Um, it wasn't a very nice time generally to live in. Um, these factories weren't exactly safe. A lot of these cities were growing uh, tremendously, and they weren't really ready for it. So for Karl Marx, these two classes were the bourgeoisie, and those were the people who he defined as the owners. And he said they owned the means of production, essentially. They were the ones who were the employers. They owned the factories. They owned all these new businesses that, is, that had started up. On the other hand, we had the proletariat, and the proletariat were the working people. So the proletariat were those people who... Um, they relied on the bourgeoisie for their livelihood. So he said this has always been the case. There's always been sort of two classes in society, those who have power and those that don't have power. And that's, that's kind of where this idea starts. Now, uh, Max Weber, who's another famous early sociologist and really um, right along with Karl Marx, sort of contemporary here, um, he, he expands this idea and says, well, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. And be sure to take a look at, at uh, Weber's ideas um, they're in the book, but I just want to sort of, you know, show you some of these different possibilities. But what really, what's really important here is that there's definitely different classes of people, whether we use the term bourgeoisie or proletariat, or we use upper class and middle class and lower class, or we use, you know, working class. There's a lot of different terms that people use, but there certainly are different classes of people in the United States. And one of the things we see is that it leads to this social stratification. So that's that structure of inequality that individuals experience based upon the society in which they live. So we div essentially it means we divide people based upon certain characteristics. It could be class, it could be race, it could be gender. Um, in this case, we're, of course, we're going to talk about class. One thing uh, that had happened in our society, and this is probably the reason we don't talk about class very, very often, is there's two potential types of class systems in the world. You can have a closed class system or you can have an open class system. In a closed class system, you are essentially, uh, you belong to the social class or the group that your parents belong to. So mobility is not an option. Um, examples of closed caste systems were uh, apartheid, which we saw in South Africa, the slave, or slave system in the United States, where you were born into a, a system and there was a good chance you were going to uh, die in that class that you were born into, either by law and slavery or, or by tradition, however the case is. 
Um, the caste system was found in India. And we'll mention that, but the idea was mobility didn't really exist. It wasn't even, in, in many ways, it just wasn't even legal or even a possibility. Now, we oftentimes talk about the United States being an open class system. And certainly, um, certainly you can move social classes in the United States. That is, you can start off poor and end up wealthy, and you can start off when wealthy and end up poor. I mean, there's certainly possibilities. I'm mean, not saying that they're not. But one of the reasons we probably don't talk about uh, our class, uh, the class system, or the classes that we have is because the idea is that it's fair and equal for everyone. And so... Um, this is certainly not the case when we look at access to resources. So, do people move up and down the social ladder in the United States? Absolutely. Do they move up and down the social ladder as much as we think? Uh, probably not. You know, all the research says that in general, uh, children end up in about the same spot their parents are. Uh, occasionally, maybe a step up, of course. Uh, you can go higher. There's, you know, of course, the, the, the situations. One of the problems, of course, is that people who do move greatly up or down the social class, or greatly up at least the social class, oftentimes you know a lot about them. So it could be a, you know, a, a famous musician or a business person. Uh, Jay Z is a great example of someone growing up poor and ending up in the very sort of upper class by income basis. So um, they may be very popular, but it certainly is not the norm in our society to see a lot of class mobility, even though we are technically in an open class system. So um, I, I do want to mention here, um, go back to this one actually, because I do want to mention that one of the most important issues in regards to this is wealth. Uh, wealth versus income. Now, just remember that income is the money that you make in a given year, in a given period of time. So that's how much money y y you make. Um, wealth is actually a little bit more important. Wealth includes all your assets. It includes not only your income, but it includes any property you own, any insurance, and, and very importantly, savings and investments. So um, depending on the social class you're in, for example, uh, those of us in the lower class or lower middle classes, uh, our assets tend to be almost exclusively income. Uh, hopefully at some point you get a house and then you can add a little property to it. Um, you should be saving, but uh, but in reality what we see is amongst the, the lower and working class, very little in savings and investment. There's just not enough, a, a lot left over. Um, but on the other hand, when you look at the upper classes, you tend to see a lot more in savings and investments as opposed to income. So, just something to, to sort of think about the difference between wealth and income. Now, there are there is social mobility that I mentioned that has to do with our open class system, right? Um, but one of the issues uh, here is there's two two types of social of social mobility we're going to talk about. Um, there's intergenerational mobility and there's structural mobility. So intergenerational mobility is the one people generally think about when you talk about moving up or down the ladder. So it's, your ch it's a change in a class position that occurs from one generation to the next. So in other words, where do you end up compared to your parents? Right? That's intergenerational mobility. Of course, all parents generally want to see their kids move up that social ladder, at least some. Structural mobility um, is become more common in our society, and structural mobility are th movements up or down the ladder that is attributed to changes in the structure of society. So I'll give you an example here. Um, in, in the last few decades, we've seen uh, vast numbers of factories closing in the United States. So uh, there's less and less factory jobs in the United States now. So a lot of so many 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 millions of Americans have moved out of that blue working class uh, middle class in fact the blue working collar middle class position into different types of jobs not because of any individual thing that happened but because truly the structure of society is changing right the factory world that that the America used to be the United States used to be is not really here anymore yes we still have factories but we'll never probably be in a situation where 50% of all um, of all people in the workforce work in factories that's just not what happened increasingly more and more people are working in those service sectors that's why we see more and more people in college because there's a realization that factories aren't really the future of the United States but service jobs are jobs like nursing and engineering and things where you are um, really uh, using your brain to 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 
uh, solve a problem but not necessarily physically creating something right? so so that's that idea of social mobility and um, I just want to sort of you know there's so much we can cover here but I want to do look here at the poor real quickly because this is one of those very stereotyped groups in the United States there's this notion that the um, that people who are poor in the United States uh, or a majority of people who are poor in the United States are sort of a welfare class uh, people are on a lot of welfare uh, that sort of thing and that's really not the truth when we look at the data one of the things that's very clear is that um, a vast 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 majority of all the people who are poor in the United States are working poor so that is people who are in the workforce who are um, trying to earn a living but are just aren't learning enough to um, support themselves or their family at least uh, above the poverty line it's also of course a very fluid location a very fluid class excuse me and what I mean by that is that people tend to go in and out of poverty over the period of years so a majority of people so this is how long does poverty last a majority of people poverty is not extremely long lasting it's one year or less however and this is what you see is that um, when someone goes into poverty then they might get a job or get an extra job and then they bounce out of poverty but not too far out uh, you know just above the line um, uh, and, but then of course something happens someone gets sick or ill or loses a job and then you're back in poverty so there's sort of this bouncing along that poverty line as opposed to people who are just 100 percent stuck in poverty or people who are not in poverty and of course in our modern economy this has become even more and more true um, as so many more jobs are are short lasting compared to the old days when people sort of worked at one place perhaps for their entire lives um, location also relates to poverty you can look at places uh, and see that um, poverty rates are highest for example if you see down here poverty rates are highest Mississippi uh, Louisiana Kentucky Arkansas and New Mexico's there tends to be higher in, in the deep south um, there's trends that go along with this and then we won't get into them in this class but there's also states, uh, if you notice, Ohio's right there in the middle. Ohio's in the middle of almost all measures, it seems, all sociological measures. So Ohio tends to be sort of a middle state, and that's also probably why it's uh, always such a swing state during elections, because they're kind of in the middle on everything. But what you'll notice is that, you know, there's certain areas where you have higher levels of poverty. Um, for example, uh, and just give it as an example, Mississippi, which has the highest level of poverty in the United States. It's also a, a state that has a very low levels of spending on education. So th there are connections that you can see when you actually start looking at these trends as you go through them. But this certainly relates to social class. Um, and I do want to mention one more thing. Of course, poverty is not equally spread out. Uh, people belonging to different groups have different likelihoods of being in poverty. If you look, for example, um, at minority groups in the United States, minority groups, this is uh, Native Americans, this is African Americans, this is Latinos, minority groups have higher levels of poverty uh, than, do, uh, than do some of the, the other groups, certainly whites. And notice that the elderly actually have lower levels of poverty uh, some of our highest levels of poverty, in fact, uh, come from people who are children. So children are the group that tend to be hit, affected most by poverty, and uh, that, that can be, of course, very problematic. And, of course, women as well uh, are much more likely to be affected by poverty than are men. Uh, we even in sociology call that the feminization of poverty. So, um, so there's a lot of things going on here and I just wanted you to get sort of thinking about it the social class has a big impact on us because where we live in our social class impacts our access to education it impacts the kind of schools we're going to it impacts our ability to um, protect ourselves when things go bad for example having a reserve of money so uh, be sure to read through the chapter lots of great information here and also once again have a great week but be sure to you look at all the materials and materials folder and get all those assignments done each and every week um, we're getting closer to the end so have a great week um, and hang in there